Yeah, so choice and actually agency were the central themes for us when we set out to make this story because uh, choice is often a luxury for many people and certainly for many women. Um, and the idea really was to, uh, to, to talk about how actually uh, once these women were given that rare chance to, uh, you know, through this swap to actually explore uh, themselves, to explore this world out there, um, it, it, uh, it empowers them sometimes to maybe go back to doing something conventional, but oftentimes to explore some completely new way of life. So uh, it's, it, was, it was a very powerful sort of symbolic uh, idea for us, the idea that if choice is given, if agency is given to the woman, um, you know, uh, it gives them the power to define their lives, to imagine their own futures. And that was the reason we used what was on the face of it, a, sort of a comedy of errors with this swap, to actually show what could happen if you actually took that first step or you were given that chance. And then that sort of ultimately plays out in both their storylines, because even though they have different goals as far, you know, J.L. wants to go and study agriculture and then Poole ends up uh, m going forward with marrying Deepak, but uh, they both kind of come to the same realization about that agency towards their future, right? Yes, uh, because we, I think, uh, for us, for instance, with the veil itself, you know, it's sort of symbolic in the fact that it both reveals and conceals, and in this story it's used uh, in, as in some way as protection, uh, as a veil of invisibility, but it's also for some women can be a constraint. So um, really it's about women having the agency, the choice, the freedom to determine what they want to do with their lives and how they um, you know, choose to take the opportunities that they're offered. Um, so yeah, the, both of them take fairly different perhaps paths, but the fact that Poole chooses to live within the conventional, traditional setup of marriage, but still perhaps has a whole new understanding of freedom within that space of a conventional relationship, is what we wanted to offer to audiences. And uh, you mentioned the image of the veil. There's this one specific image in the film that I uh, kept coming back to as I was re-watching it uh, when she's working at the tea shop and she sort of wraps up her earnings in a piece of the veil. Uh, can you just talk about that? Because that one really stood out to me. Yeah, so actually that's, that's exactly one of my favorite scenes actually. And it's, it was a very powerful symbol for us because the veil is often seen very much uh, with negativity or the fact that it could be seen as uh, extremely you know, traditional or backward. But in this case, it offers her you know, the, the fact that something that could be a constraint is also the same thing that she ties her first earnings in, which is the financial independence that we really, really wanted to underline and, um, you know, sort of um, uh, very much talk about in this story because I do feel that uh, the most importantly, women's freedoms begin with financial independence. So the fact that that same veil, which was in, a, in some way a metaphor for the limitations around women also became, you know, the place where she found her key to freedom, in a sense. And some of the most compelling moments in these, you know, journeys of discovery, uh, there's this great emphasis placed on sort of these sisterhood type relationships, you know. Uh, we obviously see Pool and Manjumai at the, at the tea shop, but then uh, uh, Jaya and sort of the members of Deepak's family, we kind of see this very, uh, complimentary sort of conversations happening between them and sort of this, the way they lift each other up. Can you talk about those dynamics? We, very, we, have, we, we really wanted to explore how uh, women and uh, actually people, we, uh, we find so many allies among men as well. Uh, we, we would you would find those allies if you look for them and that there are supportive networks. Uh, there are women with, um, who, who perhaps really need that kind of um, the sorority of sisterhood uh, will find it if they perhaps look for it or ask for it. And there, there are, there's a lot of resilience, there's a lot of strength that uh, we wanted to show in women that you least 
perhaps expect to have it because in very conventional perhaps setups, women like the mother-in-law, the grandmother-in-law, you wouldn't expect uh, to be able to perhaps change their perspective or outlook on life. So the idea that uh, that women should and can support each other and that men are incredibly important allies in that sort of transformative journey for women is something that we really wanted to explore. And uh, one of the things I love about the way you've shot this movie is the, the setting itself plays such a significant role as we're watching. It almost becomes a character unto itself as we're kind of exploring this particularly rural part of central India. Can you talk about uh, the significance of that setting? Uh, so the Indian village, which, you know, has for, been seen in so many films, I feel, you know, has either been, has often been either very exotic or been shown as very backward. And we really wanted to sort of explore and immerse an audience in the very colorful, vibrant, alive landscape of rural India and uh, and take a fairly fresh view on it in the sense that it's quite unexpected the kinds of people that you meet there, the, um, you know, while it's very deeply rooted in sort of uh, tradition and culture, you also find people who are fairly modern and, um, you know, sort of open to change. So the, the setting was very important for us. We wanted to obviously depict the very beautiful uh, agrarian landscape of uh, central India, um, the mud, the adobe houses and, uh, you know, the colors of, of the, you know, textiles and uh, the landscape. So it was a, it, it really was a character, but also very, uh, and, and very symbolic of how rooted this story is, uh, while at the same time sort of trying to take you into the inner lives of the people who live there. So on the surface of it, very beautiful, but also very complex, very, you know, um, interesting characters. And yeah, you mentioned the sort of variety of characters to which we're introduced. Uh, what I particularly love about all of them that you've introduced is in a lot of you know comedy movies with a very propulsive plot, they can those characters can kind of be minimized to you know archetypes or uh, you know just kind of thing people we encounter along the way just to help the protagonist move forward. But uh, even sort of the side characters we meet, they're all very fully developed and we can kind of get a sense of them as individuals rather than just additions to the plot. Yeah, we the the, the story actually offered us that uh, kind of canvas to uh, people this landscape with very interesting oddball characters that could be really memorable and even if they were there for a, just a moment like uh, one of my favorites is the chutney man, you know, the man who keeps coming back to ask for chutney um, and gets sort of wrapped on the knuckles and then slowly, you know, Manjumai warms to him. Uh, characters like that were uh, very important for us also because uh, we're a very diverse people. There's all kinds of, you know, experiences. There's all kinds of backgrounds that people come from. And, uh, and honestly, the, the story gave us that scope to um, have you know, the littlest characters be uh, in some way layered, have their, uh, a little arc wherever they were, whether it was something small like the chutney man or the station master, two characters like Chotu or Abdul or the friends. you know. Um, so I, I think all credit goes to my screenwriter, Sneha Desai, um, for writing such interesting characters so that this sort of la landscape came alive. And uh, the way you've shot the film is, you know, very compelling because there are these moments where it's kind of, we're able to observe and kind of get a sense of the geography of this area, but then we also have these uh, compelling emotional moments and there's such this close, you know, visual intimacy with the characters as they're going on these journeys. Can you talk about your uh, philosophy uh, to the visuals of the film? Um, yeah, it was, uh, well, my, I, I, was, I drew a lot from photography when I was uh, just sort of visualizing this film because, uh, you know, we've had um, some great photographers shoot the interiors of India, um, very beautifully photographers like Raghubir Singh, um, even uh, Mary Ellen Mark, who did a book called Falkland Road. We had Mitch Epstein do a fantastic book called In India, uh, Steve McCurry. I mean, we have lots of great 
images of rural India. So uh, in sort of framing it and sort of in some way documenting life in rural India, we already had references, but also to use these very beautiful, colorful landscapes to explore the inner lives of these characters, more uh, sort of intimate moments with these characters was also what I uh, wanted to do with the cinematography. So uh, we did extensive, of course, wrecking. Um, we also uh, were very conscious that we, um, you know, had, had this fantastic landscape, but the story was really about these people and these girls and their struggle. So um, it was really working with my cinematographer to achieve that, to give you a really particular sense of place and space and culture, and uh, really the sight and sound and smell of India, but also really keeping the characters and their journeys at the center of it. And uh, the edits of the film is, you know, it, we talked about sort of the tonal balance you've established, and that's sort of reflected in the editing because we have this very sort of tightly knit story that we're following along, and it has, it kind of feels like sort of we're just on this roller coaster with these characters, but it also kind of balances that out with these, uh, you know, more slower uh, emotional moments, and we can kind of the edit sort of mirrors those emotions so well. Can you talk about uh, that uh, balance uh, from the perspective of the editing process? Um, yeah, you know, in the editing was particularly tricky because actually I'd never done comedy before, so actually um, sort of fine-tuning it to get, to get the laughs, to land each of the uh, moments of humor was really what my editor Jabin and I worked very long and hard on. In fact, we actually changed the entire first five or 10 minutes of the film because we just found that the way it was written in the script was taking too long for the, you know, sort of roller coaster, as you said, to take off. You know, it was plateau for quite a few minutes. So uh, it, was, it was a wonderful journey of editing to find the rhythm of the story. Uh, it, we wanted it to be, like you said, a bit of a journey, a roller coaster that kind of takes you around twists and turns that you don't expect. Um, and to keep the plot ticking uh, right through to keep you moving. Um, and at the same time to uh, sort of, you know, highlight small character arcs, to, you know, the little moments of realizations of the characters, you know, to also keep it personal while this plot is uh, sort of carrying the story forward. So uh, it, was a, it was a really great learning for me. I thoroughly enjoyed editing this film. And uh, yeah, you mentioned sort of following, you know, the characters. Uh, the cast you've assembled is incredible. Uh, and, you know, when you sort of do any research on this, a lot of them are sort of relative newcomers to the big screen and they've given such uh, compelling, powerful performances. You know, what did the casting process look like kind of uh, with this main cast of young actors? Yeah, most of the cast, uh, at least the three lead uh, actors, this is their first film, um, and it was wonderful because they were really raw, but they were very open to being kind of molded, uh, and the whole casting experience was incredibly uh, intensive and very immersive for all of us because we were doing it during COVID and uh, looking at all these tapes uh, sitting in our office, but honestly, um, the fact that we had this young, raw talent also working with quite experienced actors, like Ravi Kishan has done, I don't know, 500 films, the, 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 the police, the policeman, and um, uh, Chaya Kadam is also, the Manjumai is a very well uh, known and experienced actress. So we, they had the uh, sort of uh, benefit of being mentored by really great actors, and we did a lot of workshops. Uh, well in advance of filming so we could get them, you know, to hear each other and tonally sort of, you know, um, get their rhythms going. So it was a, it was a great, really a fun process because I had the freedom to really cast these actors exactly the way I saw them, you know, in my head uh, without the baggage of having to look for a star who would fit those parts. So I think that uh, really helped me. And I mean, so many of their, you know, most compelling moments in the film, they're so quiet and introspective and, you know, they managed to do so much while saying so little. Can you talk about kind of directing the actors in scenes like those? Uh, well, I was very, very lucky to have extremely good actors. Um, 
And I think uh, for, for me, the, the trick was actually in a very, very fast-paced plot to try and find those moments. And uh, while we, we were shooting under very difficult and uh, sort of we were shooting actually during Omicron, so we were shooting under very difficult conditions, uh, obviously on a very small budget film. Uh, I sort of had the faith that these actors would, you know, they were kind of instinctively giving me the moments that I needed, which I actually really, which any director does is cherry pick the right ones when you're editing. But because these actors had sort of found the soul of these characters, they were able to do it with great efficiency, you know, it was extremely um, easy for me to get them to the place that I wanted. So, um, for instance, uh, pool crying in the railway station toilet, you know, it was very early morning. We had to crack it in literally a one and a half hour window. And it was almost one of the first few scenes that she had to do as an actor you know, a breakdown scene, which is really hard, and it's her first film. But, um, you know, we we talked uh, for, for about half an hour before the shot. Uh, she took a, a, a time to get her head in the right place, and I think it's because the actors had the, um, you know, the, the, the luxury of having lived with the characters and workshopped well before they came to set. She was able to really do that in two takes. Oh, wow. We literally had two takes and we were done with that. So actually it was um, a combination, I think, of preparation and also really casting actors who perfectly fit the role. And you mentioned uh, Ravi Kishan's performance as the police inspector, which it's such a memorable role for him because it's this very complex character that kind of has all of these different elements of the film kind of embodied in it because, you know, he has this morally gray character who does good things and bad things. He comes around in the end and does the right thing. And then he also has these, you know, fun comedic moments throughout the film. Can you, you know, talk about how that, uh, that role and that character, how that sort of evolved as the film was being made? You know, the, uh, when the script was originally written, Manohar's character was sort of a much more uh, straight up sort of investigative sort of cop and not very uh, morally gray the way you see him now. And um, actually to embellish his role because I really felt like we needed a more uh, interesting character to sort of challenge Jaya's intelligence. Um, we brought in this writer called Divyanidhi Sharma who has additional dialogue credit and he actually really worked on Manohar's character to bring out this sort of very, very untrustworthy, you know, unpredictable character um, uh, who still is, you know, able to convince you at the end when he does the turnaround, you know. So it was, it was a wonderful journey, actually, of working with great writers because, uh, of course, the, uh, Biplab, who wrote the original script, uh, set a beautiful blueprint for us. Neha wrote the whole screenplay. And then Divyanidhi came in and really brought a lot of these characters to life. And I think, um, you know, creating this very, very complex character whom actually is very believable. You don't quite, don't really like him, but you still enjoy his performance and you still believe that he's capable of uh, some good in the end was uh, was great fun and a great challenge to actually get right, honestly. And the score in this film is incredible. It's this great emotional backbone that kind of serves as this metronome as we go throughout, you know, this, uh, you know, comedic caper type of story. Uh, can you talk about, you know, working with your composer and crafting that? Um, so yeah, the music was actually a great process for me. We, I started working with Ram well before we, you know, while we were casting actually. Uh, and we had in mind uh, as a sort of, because music really uh, shapes, you know, the em emotional landscape of a film really, because, you know, it takes you uh, to places that perhaps your plot doesn't always, or your characters can't, you know, it taps something much deeper, uh, at least I feel. and. Ram really understood the soul of the film. And uh, when we were discussing the kind of music that we wanted for the film, we decided that we'd have something 
uh, quite fresh and not typically Indian folk music, which you would associate with a, a film that's set in a village. Well, we wanted sort of world folk, um, and we both are very interested in world music, Indian classical music, uh, Indian folk, uh, and traditional semi-classical music. So. Um, we used a lot of instrumentation from around the world. We sort of chose instruments for each of the characters. For instance, uh, Deepak and Pool's romantic track uh, had the kora, which is a West African instrument, uh, string instrument, and uh, the tongue drum for Jaya, you know, the bell-like sounds for her sort of, you know, sh shadiness, and um, the harmonium for Manohar's character. And, uh, you know, lots of Indian folk instruments like the morsing and the kamok and, you know. Um, we, we really enjoyed creating these uh, themes for each of the uh, tracks that we had. And of course, creating songs, which I had never done before, so it was a, a first for me. Um, and actually, all credit really goes to Ram, who has the widest sort of uh, and deepest understanding of uh, music from all over the world. So he was able to sort of bring this film to you know, have a sort of sonic and musical world that we could create for this film. And you mentioned the songs where we have these kind of musical interludes and the lyrics are very, you know, deeply tied to the themes that are unfolding. Were those, you know, always built into the script or were those uh, something that came about when you were scoring the film? Uh, some of them were written in. Um, uh, for instance, we the, the song that comes in the end was actually meant to come right in the beginning, and it was a song of a girl leaving home and, you know, all her trepidations, her worries. Um, and that was written in, and the sh song of Jaya in the market, the Shady Lady song, uh, Dautwa as we call it, that was written in. But the love song, interestingly, was never written as a song. It was going to be just a love theme. Uh, and uh, the very first song, like I said, we re sort of uh, sort of edited the first ten minutes, and we needed then a song to fit that new beginning, and so we added a song in the beginning. So it ended up having four songs instead of two, but um, yeah, but but the uh, but I felt each of the songs really had a purpose in the film, and they weren't you know just sort of a musical interlude for for you know no real reason. It was really to take the story and the characters, story forward, go deeper into the characters and their journey. Um, so yeah, it was great fun doing the songs. And so uh, this film, uh, it's the first film you've directed since Dobie Got, which was uh, many years ago. Can you, uh, what was it about this particular story and the original script? Can you talk about uh, what it was that really spoke to you about this one to uh, direct it? Yeah, it was, uh, I was, I think, struggling for a long time because I was writing a lot, but I somehow, none of the screenplays that I was writing really materialized as I'd envisioned them. I mean, I would, um, and when I, when this script came to me through Amir, actually, who read it in a, when he was a jury of a screenwriting competition, uh, I knew that this was it, you know, this, because this, story on the face of it was just this comedic caper, but it allowed me to explore so many themes that I wanted to actually, uh, you know, discuss and, you know, bring to a wider audience, you know, themes of agency and women's freedoms and women's education, uh, self-discovery, creating space for yourselves, you know, uh, encouraging each other. These were things that I, I feel very strongly about and this film allowed me to do all of it, but uh, in a very engaging, sort of entertaining way. So um, yeah, as soon as I read it, I knew I'd sort of found a story uh, onto which I could piggyback sort of a lot of ideas that I am very keen to actually share with audiences and I feel are uh, important, you know, uh, to share with people. And uh, the film was recently named as uh, India's entry to compete for the international Oscar and uh, the film's been released theatrically and, you know, the audiences who have been out to see it, it's been pretty heavily embraced and celebrated. Can you talk about the reactions the film has gotten so far and uh, what that means to you? Yeah, so we had our, uh, our premiere at TIFF at uh, Toronto International Film Festival, and actually, you know, we had a 
standing ovation there and the, the warmth that we, we've been feeling every time we've shown the film. It's just been a lot of overwhelming sort of love and positivity uh, that we've had from audiences. So it's really been a very wonderful journey. Uh, theatrically, we had a great run. The film got a sort of new lease of life on Netflix and people, in fact, uh, you know, went back to cinemas to watch it because the film was still running. Uh, when it came on Netflix, and uh, honestly, it's this is you know I would go in for the last ten or fifteen minutes to just watch audiences and hear them laugh and cry at the same time, and you know I just uh, it's it's the best reward for any filmmaker, you know, when audiences react so warmly to a film. So yeah, that was that's been really really rewarding, and and uh, you know we didn't expect to be uh, chosen as India's entry, so it was a it's a huge honor, and honestly, for me, it, it's a great opportunity, really, to uh, bring this film to new audiences, you know, in this part of the world who perhaps would not otherwise have had a chance to see the film and to share this film, you know, I hope with a much, much wider uh, viewership. So I feel this story is sort of very important to um, to share and to bring to people, and this has given me that opportunity. So I'm really grateful. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure to speak with you about the film, and thank you for sharing it with our audience. Thank you so much. Thank you.